Phone rings in a screen movie cliche. That's Channing Tatum. It is not. Is it? Yeah, from his Abercrombie days. You are being punked. Actually, this is more of a catfish situation. Punk would be if Ashton Kutcher turned up and told you both that you aren't actually in Scream 4, you're in a movie inside a movie being played in Scream 4. But that would be far too cruel. Where are you going? To make sure the front door is locked. You may think it would be difficult to send this part of the movie because it isn't real and is explicitly designed to hit the same cliché beats as any generic slasher so it can give a big old middle finger to lesser films. The problem is we, the audience of this movie, are still being forced to sit through aforementioned clichés. Congratulations on a point well made, but it's still your damn movie that got me kicked out of the theater after my fifth oh come on in less than three minutes. Pretty Little Dyer. A bunch of articulate teens sit around and deconstruct horror movies. Ma'am, I am an adult. The whole self-aware, postmodern meta sh**. Stick a fork in 996 already. When you're done with that fork, please, God, please stick it into my brain before I have to listen to this franchise refer to itself in the meta third person again. It begs the question that if the beginning of Stab 7 is Stab 6, then is the beginning of Stab 6 Stab 5? And if so, what is Stab 4 about? Begging the question is actually the fallacy of basing your argument on the assumption that the thing your argument is based on is true. Ironically, the only thing that is begging the question here is her assumption that Stab 5 is the opening to Stab 6 based on the fact that Stab 6 is the opening to Stab 7. And I apologize in advance for the 15 times you're going to have to replay this sin before it makes any damn sense. Somebody falls for it every year. Why you get off on this? <laughs> Jenny just used a ghost face voice app to make Marnie think she was about to die, and now Marnie has been killed by an actual ghost face killer while Jenny was explaining this to her. I know the ghost face killers have almost psychic abilities to plan their attacks, but this is some of the most convenient bullshit to ever convenience in one of these films. Good one, Marnie. Lights out. Bone on the floor. Friday night lights out. Is this Trevor? Do I sound like a Trevor to you? Maybe the sequels never quite capture the original film's spirit, but god damn it, the ghost face voice is always chilling. Roger Jackson created an icon with his voice and deserves a sin-off. What movie? Same one Marnie's in. I mean, I get that Marnie is considered a lesser Hitchcock by some, but I'm not sure CGI-ing Amy Teagarden into it will improve the end result. You're the dumb blonde with the big t We'll have some fun with you before you die. I have a 4.0 GPA and 135 IQ, asshole. Jenny would be magna cum laude at CinemaSense. <laughs> I'm sure Rory Culkin and or Emma Roberts are in hella shape, but are they in throwing Britt Robertson's corpse with enough force to crash through a window shape? I'm leaning no. The garage door starts coming down at this moment, but in the next shot, Ghostface is just now pressing the button. <laughs> So it turns out this has all been layer upon layer of very self-aware screamception bullshit commentary that explains how dumb and lazy other horror franchises are. Cool idea! But the problem is that the rest of this film does very little to separate itself from the exact thing it is parodying, including its own actual opening which comes complete with the very same jump scares, pranks, and helpless teenagers it is critiquing. Me thinks the sequel don't protest too much! Whoa! Whoa! whoa. 25! Stay alive! Oh, Sorry, Sheriff! Are you though? This is a pretty close community. I'm sure Kirby knew this was the sheriff's house, even if the damn police truck with sheriff written on the back of it wasn't a big enough clue. Hey, before you get in the car, you have to promise not to kill me. Obvious force slashering. By the way, have you seen the Grim Reaper? Angel of Death? What are you talking about? Your cousin. This is a pretty insensitive way to talk to your friend about their relative, especially since said relative is a person who has been through a decade of nightmare-inducing trauma. Sure, she's making money from it, but jeez, she didn't ask to be the subject of three shitty movies, or the Stab franchise. Wherever she went, people died. I guess that's true of the first two films, although you could argue in the first Scream it wasn't somewhere Sydney went since Woodsboro was the place she lived and grew up in, but in Scream 3 she is forced to come to LA by the killer and bodies had already started piling up before she got there, so f*** off Olivia with your bullshit Grim Reaper theory. Stab is the wrong franchise for her, it should be Final Destination. Well that makes no f***ing sense. There are only a handful of characters in the entire Final Destination franchise who make it through one movie, and even then they're apparently killed off screen. The whole point of those films is that death eventually wins. If this movie is going to just name drop other slashers films without putting any thought into whether they apply to the situation, I'm just gonna start sending random sh** too, like this school bus, or this ear, or this lamp! Wait, what actually is the point of this lamp? Why is Jenny Randall calling me? Why are you this surprised someone you took the time to have listed in your contacts is calling it? What? Wait, watch out! Randomly pointless f***ing jump scares! Seriously, what the f*** was that? There's no killer lurking. Creepy phone call had ended. The scene wasn't building to any sort of tense reveal, so what was the point? It's like the script came with an insert jump scare here instruction on every third page regardless of whatever the f*** is happening on screen. Angel of death. Oh, f***. You're blaming Sydney for that too? F*** you, dude. 
this movie. You're not cheating on your wife if you eat my lemon square. Deputy Hicks jumps from some light flirting to insinuating an actual affair in less time than it takes to grab a lemon square. And yes, that is apparently a euphemism, I think. We have two pieces of toast. We have three pieces of toast. I have no idea what to write. Well, here's your first problem, Gail. What kind of a sociopath writes in Cambria? Here with the luscious Olivia, don't look at my t I have a mind, Morris. Robbie survives this for now. <laughs> you could do a lot worse, trust me. I can only assume that the physics club science the shit out of this locker door to get it to create a quantum bubble of silence that allowed Trevor to get within inches of Jill and Kirby without being hurt. It's either that or just plain old movie magic bullshit, but I like the science, so let's go with that. Trevor Sheldon denied live on Hall Pass with Robbie Mercer. Captured live? I think not. If Douchecast over here is trying to film juicy gossip for his blog, he really needs to work on his positioning. Considering this is where we see him recording from, there's no way he caught a single word of what they said, and the only footage he would have caught is the bobbing heads of these passing students. What is up with the organization in this bookstore? There are three nonfiction books, Patton, Jimmy Carter's Autobiography, and The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mixed in with a fantasy work of fiction in Aragon. Bookstore doesn't know how to shelve correctly. Excuse me, Gail, he's conducting an interview. Great, I love interviews. You'll have to wait, Gail, sorry. Can't let you in there. It sure sounds like Officer Judy is being painted as a pain in the ass here, but what is she actually doing wrong? Gail is the one attempting to insert herself into a police interview as a civilian. Why does being the wife of the sheriff get you special treatment? Your lemon squares taste like ass. That's weird because I've often been told my ass tastes like lemon. Does that mean that I'm not gonna live as long as these two? No. Maybe. Of course not. What the f dude? Maybe? God damn it. Some of the humor in this film really makes me wish it would pick a lane instead of straddling the blade between an actual slasher film and f***ing scary movie. Her mom was my sister. I have scars too. Crack me, they drag poor Mary McDonald into this. My president deserves better. What are you doing in the house with Sidney Prescott? I mean, that's like being on top chef with Jeffrey Dahmer. Actually, it's not. Jeffrey Dahmer is a serial killer. Sidney Prescott is a victim. F***ing Trevor. Just making my rounds before taking off. Great. Thanks. Sydney doesn't feel the need to share the fact that some punk teenager managed to slip past the cops and into a bedroom totally unnoticed. Yeah, he wasn't the killer, but it damn well could have been. Why isn't she losing her freaking shit right now and demanding the cops outside be immediately fired? Yeah. She can live next door to me. A grown man lusting after a high school student. Now seriously, uh... Uh, Mary, I'm, I'm warning you, okay? Playing a better movie in your movie, so now all I want to do is go watch that movie instead of your movie. Your mom home? She's been boyfriends. Kirby may as well have just said, are you alone and going to be murdered tonight? I'm asking for the audience. I would never presume to know what it's like to be a teenage girl, but I have enough surrounding context to know that bras are, by and large, seen as about as uncomfortable as a pair of barbed wire lace briefs. So, wouldn't this be the first thing that Olivia would take off as opposed to the last? But I suppose we shouldn't let little things like realism get in the way of gratuitous male gaziness. Speaking of stab, you heard where the stab going to be yet? No, it doesn't matter to me anyways. My mom doesn't let me go. Which is something Olivia should know, unless they've been friends for less than a year. Jill and Kirby stand at the window watching Olivia get murdered instead of alerting any of the three cops currently guarding Jill's house. She's going up there unarmed? She could have stopped at the kitchen first? Damn it. After the shit she's been through, I wouldn't even judge her for carrying a gun at all times. What is up with all the blood? Did Ghostface butcher three more people in Olivia's room before she got home? This makes the amount of blood in Johnny Depp's death in A Nightmare on Elm Street look plausible. He's in here. Where is he? Come on, man, the six foot tall dude wearing a ghost mask that you 100% either saw vanish in front of your eyes or run out the back door? That guy. I know you know the one I mean because there's no one else here and there is no way you missed that sh disposable cop number two. Hey. Are you okay? No, of course she's not okay, asshat. She's just come face to face with a serial killer and is on the floor bleeding, so maybe call her a damn ambulance and a therapist. Away with your inept platitude. Away! You should look upstairs. That's a weird way of saying, no, of course I'm not okay, asshat, I just came face to face with a serial killer and I'm on the floor bleeding, so call me a damn ambulance and a therapist away with your inept platitude away. Chief, we're sorry. I feel terrible. All right. Get out of here. Get out of here. This is the very definition of you have one job. A teenage girl is dead because of these incompetent chuckle f and they are barely getting a slapped wrist. Charlie's nose and face have zero blemishes after receiving this kick from Sydney. Our local legacy, the stab movies, it's coming to life. Yes, Robbie Mercer is the conscienceless, misogynistic asshole of the movie. But he's so one note as to be unbelievable and even painful to watch. He just referred to the recently passed Olivia as the girl who will never date him, and gleefully listed all the other victims, his classmates whose deaths are making his blog so exciting. Was he written this way so we'd be happy when he gets killed? Because that's pretty f***ed up too. So, 
You two are the boys that run the movie club at Woodsboro High, huh? It's called Cinema Club. Not making it sound any better, Charlie. What if we could catch the killer? By working together. Gail has proven to be a lot of things over this series, and she's rarely playing by the rules, but would this Gail, who has been through three different iterations of the ghost face killings, willingly bring two high school kids into her killer chasing activities? I don't think she would. Maybe in the first or second scream I buy this, but here, this development feels false. What would you say? I love you. Very good. Pamela smarting the situation to your advantage. A visit from Sydney Prescott? I mean, she's the star. Oh. <laughs> Yes, she's Daniel Radcliffe to my J.K. Rowling. Well, no, because Harry Potter isn't based on the life of Daniel Radcliffe, is it? Although, to be honest, I don't really understand how wizards work. Or Britain. And as soon as you're clear in this investigation, we're on the next plane to New York. I booked Today, The View, Nancy Grace, MTV News. She's MTV News. I'm handling Miss Prescott's calls and appearances. May I take a message? You are the message. How exactly is Rebecca a message, though? There's already been three murders. Dewey and the rest of the Woodsboro Police Department, along with Sydney, know there is a killer out there. This is the most pointless murder in the series since the Fawns got cut up in the original. Also, was Charlie or Jill just waiting patiently in the garage until Rebecca chose to come down? How did they know when she would be leaving or that Sydney wouldn't be with her? And I guess Woodsboro isn't a huge town, but this is a hospital parking garage. The chances of getting someone alone long enough to pull this drawn out of a kill is risky business. <laughs> Thinking the driver or the car passing by could hear you screaming. It's not like there's a loud horn sound you could create by pushing a device in your car. Wait. Getting out of the car when you could call someone from the safety of your locked car. <laughs> so did Ghostface loosen the handle to the point she could pull it off or did it just conveniently come off? Either way, what a stupid f***ing scene this is. Any comment on the fact that these killings seem to resemble the pattern of the original Woodsboro murders? Pardon? Later. Gail is being a pain in the butt, but this is a legitimate question that anybody could have asked. He's only not answering because she is his wife. Man, these two really need to find some sort of work-life balance. All right, someone get up to the top of the structure. Go. You see anybody? Nobody up here. So the subtitles of the movie tell us that the voice on the radio saying nobody up here is Haas. Now we know that this here is Haas because Gail greets him when she strolls through the police station. We also know from this shot in the elevator that the structure has 10 floors, which means that Haas here somehow managed to run up 10 flights of stairs in 10 seconds and holy sh**, Clark Kent is Superman! This f***ing kid in the tree. This is a run-of-the-mill classroom that is most definitely used for things that are not cinema club related, so do they just hang these posters up before every meeting? Because that would be f***ing ridiculous. Also, having a cinema club that would have both a poster of Vertigo and a poster of Rob Zombie's H2 up in the same room. I get that the movie wants to paint Trevor as a potential killer, but he's not the killer. And from everything we saw when he first met Sydney, he was halfway flirting with her, so why is he giving her this f***ing look from hell? Beyond Jamie Lee Curtis, forget Linda Blair, I mean, this is the ultimate. Unless they've had Curtis and Blair at the cinema club meeting before, then I don't understand this comparison. Those are actors who played victims. Sydney is an actual f***ing victim that has been portrayed in movies by other actors. No one will be seated as everyone is seated and told how the third act of every horror film is cliche and predictable, including this one. Modern audiences get sad to the rules of the originals. So the reversals become the new standard. In fact, the only surefire way to survive a modern horror movie, you pretty much have to be gay. That's all kinds of various ists, but this asshole is also contradicting his own assholishness. If reversal becomes the new standard, and the standard used to be horny heterosexual couples, then wouldn't horny homosexual couples be more at risk? Two kids killed in a house when their parents are away. And then the school's hot chick savaged beyond recognition. We all know where it goes from there. A party. Except Rebecca was killed between Olivia's death and the upcoming party, so once again, why the f was Rebecca killed? This unnecessary lamp. What will it take for any of these people, especially Sydney, to stop ignoring sh like this? Sure, it might be nothing, but in your universe, nine times out of ten, it's usually something. And that something is almost always very stabby. <laughs> I know it's the standard tape they use, but... <laughs> Who the f is crossing this tape from the outside of the f***ing window? <laughs> Trevor's here. What is he doing there? That is so not his scene. It's not? Dude is in Cinema Club. I mean, my mom is just completely freaked out. As she should be. As should all the f***ing parents in this goddamn town. How did the majority of these kids get out of their houses tonight? I'm starting to drink every time someone shuts the refrigerator door and oh my god, there's that harmless character right behind it. Do you mean this sh so is the movie literally just sinning itself now? The f*** am I going all this effort for then? I guess it's less likely someone notices her up here, but regardless, why take the mask off until you've left the barn? If Gail is half the investigative reporter these movies have made her out to be, she wouldn't take this big of a risk on blowing her cover. I, I think the killer's about to make his move. What makes you so sure? You do a remake to outdo the original. That's a weird way of simply saying I just saw the killer on my hidden camera. I'm 
fix my equipment. Um, Gail, your equipment isn't just broken. It was deliberately obstructed by a serial killer, which means fixing it involves headed back inside the place where said serial killer is prowling. My point is that this should not have been such a casual statement. She's not just turning the damn things on and off again. Be careful. I'm always careful. As demonstrated by the expert way in which I flick this flashlight on and oh sh did I shine that right in your eye? Dude, I'm so sorry, I should really be more careful. Yes, let's go investigate whatever strange occurrence could be making the wind chimes make noises. I'm sure it's not simply wind, that would be silly. No! These two are still on protection duty even after Olivia's death? <laughs> Perhaps more damningly, they are still ass clanning around? Perkins just ignored a f***ing radio call asking about a possible security breach to pull this gag. What happened to feeling terrible? Is one teenage death not enough of a wake-up call to start taking your f***ing job seriously? This Anthony Anderson dramatic death dance goes on for all the sometime. Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis shame. Actually, no, that's fair. Sorry! The wind chimes were over here! That doesn't explain why Major Crimes initiated a jump scare cliche with her approach to the door, but misplaced wind chime, sure. Who are you? Turn on the TV to Channel 6. Sydney will turn to Channel 6 at the exact moment the news reporter is mentioning Gail Weathers. This is the info Jill slash Charlie wants Sydney to have, but how could they possibly know the exact time the name Gail Weathers would be uttered on the newscast? Oh, let's get the cops. The cops aren't there. What? They were there when I first came in, but they're not there now. Whoa, Nelly! It's not just that the cops aren't there. Even if Ghostface moved their bodies and their car, there would still be a huge pool of blood on the drive. Also, you're only sharing this information now? Their absence didn't ring a few alarm bells for you as you collected the f***ing groceries? Just a casual, huh, I guess that's weird. My god, these people. Are Jill or Charlie Marathon sprinters? Because one of them would need to be to make this trek around the house as quickly as Sydney and Kate get to the front door. And I guess it could be both of them in this instance, but that makes even less sense. We find out that Kirby has, in fact, picked up Jill and Charlie was at the Stabathon, and also ends up being at Kirby's. How would he have gotten away to pull this stunt off without raising suspicion? I just saw somebody coming around the side of the house. Where are Haas and Perkins? These red herring setups get more irritating the longer this movie rambles on. I'm not saying Hicks couldn't be the killer, and since she's not, where the f*** did she come from? And how did she not see Ghostface better than somebody coming from the side of the house? I'm so sorry. How did Sydney get away without Hicks hearing her? Is Sydney a f***ing ninja? Being a keen serial box observer, I can say for 100% certainty that Cheerio's box has already been opened and reshot by someone who does not have a full understanding of the concept of cardboard clasp closures. Kate bought a goddamn open box of Cheerios, and I want a f***ing explanation. No more on your own. It's you and me. Forever. It took Gail being stabbed and nearly killed for you to realize you were being a selfish ass, do we? We're supposed to like this character, right? Also, Gail has one of the more interesting character arcs in this film, and now she's going to be stuck in a hospital bed for the remainder. Awesome. The script is balls. This is what the reboots do. They, they, they one-up the original ending. Charlie is literally giving away his motives and plans, but to what end? I guess this is supposed to throw us off that he's the killer, but when we find out that he is one of the killers, seems like this becomes infuriating. Okay, no offense, guys, but I'm gonna put in Stab 7. Yes. Nobody cancels my film festival. Then why are you putting on Stab 7? You were still at the beginning of the first Stab film when Gail was attacked and the party was shut down. I could trivia your ass under the table, cinema boy. Oh, yeah? Who played Leatherface first? Gunner Hansen. This is the question you ask someone who said they could trivia your ass under the table? I get that not everyone would know the answer to this question, but a horror fan like Kirby would. The better question would be to name any other actors that played Leatherface. George Hamilton is not a correct answer, but it should be. Plant Scares, the new cat scares, with 100% more stupidity. Plants are not included, you must provide your own plant. I'm sorry, I know you're into the movie and all, but uh, now would be a really good time to make a move. Kirby did not attend my high school. Did I just interrupt something right here? Shut the f*** up. Who invited you, Trevor? <laughs> Kirby is the f***ing best. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, sudden Sydney and all that, but what I want to know is how the f*** did Sydney know where Kirby lived? Also, I actually like this franchise and its meta approach to the genre, but this fourth installment seems to think that screaming every cliché known to humankind from the rooftops gives it free reign to use them without recrimination. This is like me running through a firing range expecting a working knowledge of how bulletproof vests work to be enough to save me from a barrage of bullets. I would not come out of that situation well, and neither does this movie. I need all units to 329 Whispering Lane. I get that Dewey lives in Woodsboro and is sheriff, but the fact that he could to pull up a high school girl's address that quickly from memory is just a little disturbing. Why does everyone know where Kirby lives? Why is this cop in the back attempting to pass the other cars? They're all speeding to the same location. What a dick. I tried to call 911 but the landline's dead and someone smashed the router. I think I got through on myself. What do you mean you think you got through to 911? You've literally just talked to Dewey. I heard you yelling to Jill. Did she get away? I think she's safe. You can't take a f***ing second to check. That's your cousin. You're really satisfied that she is either cowering in fear under the bed or on the run somewhere? Why would you assume this s***? Warm up question. Jason's weapon. 
It's a machete. There, you see, you do know the genre. I mean, that's one weapon that Jason used. He's also used knives, wire, industrialized weed whackers, and in one instance, liquid nitrogen. Just saying. Not sure how Kirby's answer to this question proves her genre knowledge. Name the remake of the groundbreaking horror movie in which the villain... Halloween! Uh, Texas Chainsaw Dawn of the Dead... It's impressive and kind of fun hearing Kirby shouting all these answers off the top of her head, but why wouldn't she let Ghostface finish the question? Especially considering she really believes Charlie's life is at stake. <gasps> oh my god! Wait, why don't I feel anything? I was supposed to feel something like surprise or excitement there, wasn't I? Okay, let's have a look here. Swelling music, check. Dramatic mask reveal, check. Giving a single f who the killer is? Oh! Also, it's amazing how now that we know Jill and Charlie are the killers, Ghostface is noticeably smaller in stature. Just show some platform shoes or f***ing anything to explain this and I would have taken away the sin. Instead, here's 10 for how stupid and unrealistic these reveals are. This is the part, my dear cousin, when the cameras turn off. F***ing what? The whole point of this was to film the murders so you could cut them together and release the resulting footage as a movie. And you're not going to record the final kill? You're not going to record the death of Sidney f***ing Prescott. I mean, they definitely can't record it now because Sidney can just blab their names, so why even take off the damn mask? Good, we'll cut and upload it later make it all traceable to Trevor. Which is something Charlie obviously already knows, but hey, what's a little over-exposition between the stab buddies? I am NOT the girl you cheat on. Isn't a bullet to the a bit of a giveaway as to the sender of the bullet? Okay, it's not concrete proof, but that is a very specific choice of wound, and it is bound to throw some suspicion at the person wronged by said member. I've gone through everything. We're definitely good on timeline. How can he possibly know that? This timeline is presumably based on the eventual arrival of the cops, but how can they know exactly when Sydney called them to say that they were at Kirby's house? And even if they could know that, how could they also know how long it would take for the cops to arrive? And why would you specifically build in time to share your entire f***ing plan with two people who will very shortly be dead? Young man, I demand to see the math on this timeline. You'll slip, they always do. She already has! She revealed her identity without immediately killing you! God! The heart! <laughs> the way we rehearsed this! How exactly do you rehearse a stabbing? I mean, I know how, but does deciding a location and poking it really count as a rehearsal? They haven't actually been stabbing each other in preparation for this, have they? This has never been about killing you. It's about becoming you. Jill's desire to be a famous victim like her cousin is at least a somewhat believable motive. Charlie, however, is as bland and stereotypical of a killer as it gets. He might as well be named Stu Mickey Roman IV. I wish they'd just made Kate the other killer. A mother-daughter team-up could have been fun. And if Kate is one of the killers, at least Ghostface's height is a little more believable. Also, if Jill's plan all along was to kill Charlie, then why even let Sydney in on the fact that she's involved? Jill could have let Charlie blab whatever he wanted and deny it. Then she could have let Charlie kill Sydney, and she would then kill Charlie. Just on the off chance Sydney survives, which she does, this would give Jill a clear out, and she would still get her 15 minutes of fame. How do you think people become famous anymore? Being a niece of a famous movie star, playing the cousin of a famous author in a sequel that's part of a hit horror franchise? I mean, I'm just throwing on some guesses. I know it isn't playing Nancy Drew. Who the f*** would ever do that? <laughs> Sydney survives this. Don't tell me you didn't know this day would come. Okay, one more time with feeling. Jill is seriously not recording this? Screw the fact that Sydney knows who the killer is. She can edit that shit out no problem. I cannot believe this master plan doesn't include a way to record this as the climax to the film. Have I not mentioned that this is Sydney f***ing Prescott? I applaud her conviction, but what did this really achieve? Sure, smash the coffee table if you think that will set the scene, but does she really need the chronic back pain to sell that she's the victim here? Of course, the cops turn up exactly when they're required to, and not a moment sooner. Honestly, I wouldn't be a damn bit surprised if Dewey was in on the murders as well. I just spoiled the next screen movie, didn't I? The alarms on the monitors go off, but no one comes to check on Jill. Is there anyone actually working at this hospital? She thinks you guys should write a book together with your matching wounds. Why, she was stabbed in the shoulder? How did she know I was too? Is the fact Jill knew where Gail was stabbed really that damning? It happened at a stabathon, so isn't there at least a chance that one of the other kids saw the wound and told Jill about it? Or even told Charlie or Robbie, who could then tell Jill? Also, matching wounds could just mean matching stab wounds. Doesn't necessarily mean Jill was referring to the location of the wound itself. But, of course, the movie has to Martha its way to a conclusion somehow, and at least it means it's nearly over. I know this is all out of desperation, but how does Jill expect to spin this into her master plan? Who's she gonna say killed Sydney now? Don't even think about shooting. Or I'll blow Dewey's head off. But is there really a scenario where she doesn't blow Dewey's head off? Like, she has to eventually, right? There's no way Jill can risk letting anyone go. So Hicks should just take her shot while she can, damn it. Especially since we find out she's wearing a goddamn bulletproof vest. I'm gonna enjoy blowing your head off. Jill doesn't hear this. You forgot the first rule of remakes, Jill. Don't f*** with the original. Sydney, who is bleeding out for the second goddamn time, has the energy to stand up and deliver this ridiculous quip. Hicks, you're alive? Wear the vest. 
Save your chest. Why is this character? Jill Roberts is her name, a name the whole world will now know. Who single-handedly put a stop. These reporters are from competing channels, but have for some reason agreed to give their reports in a way that anyone flicking from channel to channel wouldn't lose any of the story, or for anyone that would just happen to be panning across for a final scene of a movie. Wait, did Jill set this shit up too? Oh, but you will sit through a movie called Stab. Hello? What's up? What's up? When you think about what she survived, she must have scars everywhere. Shh. Come on. You want to know how I got these scars? I won't be needing you anymore. Sydney. Fired. I beg your pardon? Fired. Who invited you, Trevor? My name's Trevor. Trevor Slattery. Oh. Save the cheerleader, save the world. What the sh Get it up! <laughs> ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. No, Kelly Clarkson!